Now, I noted that uh, Gavin wanted to read verse 11. And that's fine, because that's really what the message is going to be about this morning anyway. Um, the whole thrust of encouraging one another. Now, 1 Thessalonians, um, earlier in that book, like all of Paul's writing, he talks first about theology. He talk, talks about the truth of God and the gospel. He uh, always gives thanks for the church that he's uh, gone to. And, uh, and then you'll notice if you read any of his epistles through, towards the end there's a shift. And he answers the question, if that is so, so what? About living, practical living. And there's a lot of practical instruction towards the end of each of Paul's letters. Now... I'm not going to read this again because we've read it already once and I'm going to refer to it against, again later. Um, who here has a mobile phone? Have you all got mobile phones? Yeah. Do you send SMSs? They are dangerous things, SMSs. Particularly if you have an iPhone because an iPhone actually tries to preempt what you're going to type. That's what an iPhone does. I don't know whether all phones, mobile phones, do that. But to me, it's the curse of modern technology because it can make you say things you don't really mean. <laughs> if you don't go back and read it over just before you hit that little green button, you can say some very dangerous things. And, and it's a bit like that with what we call church bulletin bloopers. I've got a few for you this morning. Here's one. The senior choir invites any member of the congregation who enjoys sinning to join the choir. <laughs> Only one letter. That's a bit rugged, isn't it? Everybody joined. You were there. Here's another one. Oh, I missed one. No, I didn't. I did, yeah. Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> well, we're here to give life, not, not, not kill people. So bloopers are, are really quite interesting. There are many more. I've actually got a page full of them here, and I had a great old chuckle reading these. Staying in bed shouting, Oh, God, does not constitute going to church. No, it doesn't. I'm sorry. It doesn't. Don't wait for six strong men to bring you to church. Now, you've got to think about that one a little bit. <laughs> They'll also carry you out of church. This is an, an American one. Scouts are saving aluminum cans, aluminum cans, Bottles and other items to recycle. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. <laughs> yeah, it should be four. It should be four children. Here's another one. Do you know what hell is? Come here, our preacher. <laughs> Some of you can't crack a smile no matter what's wrong with you. Right. You see, as we come to the closing verses in 1 Thessalonians 5, we will find out that Paul was committed to conflict resolution. Now, actually, he, he gives us a protocol for preemptive peacemaking in the verses we're going to look at this morning. We could call this section... Uh, if we're, this is not a blooper, this is fair income. How to get along with people. Did anyone find that hard? Find that hard to get along with people? Depends who the people are, doesn't it? Somewhat. As I thought about that, I, I thought, ah, uh, that will be misunderstood. Try this, how to behave in church. And I'm not talking about just in the church service, I'm, I'm talking about... Uh, the church being the body of believers. How do we behave towards one another? And you all know, as well as I know, 
that the, the church is full up, filled with saints, but I understand that some are a bit like prickly pear. Some are. And so we need to think about this. We need to stop because I think Paul is referring to that in this fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. All eyes are on us. All eyes are on us. Now, if you don't believe that, let me help you to understand it. I meet so many people who tell me why they have no time for God. And you know, often it's because they know people who claim to be Christians who don't act like Christians. Now, I, I don't want to agree with that. But I'm just saying that's an excuse that people use for why they don't become part of a worshipping, caring Christian church community. The world looks at us and they look for something real. They look for something different. And I think that's what Paul's talking about in this fifth chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. This is what Paul says. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father. I give thanks. Uh, I look back over the years that I've been in pastoral ministry, started 1974, over 42 years ago. And, uh, and I give thanks to God for the, the congregations that I have been privileged to pastor. Uh, when I was a young uh, man, I was much more dogmatic about lots of things. And uh, I used to look at the older people in uh, church and say to myself, do you know, when you get to about the age 40, they go mushy. No, I used to think that. And when I got to be 40, I realized that they didn't get mushy. They just matured. The best cheeses are ones that have matured. <laughs> we still stand for the same truths that I believed when I was young but we hold them in a much more gentle manner. I give thanks to God for all the deacons that I've known, deaconesses that I've known, godly brothers and sisters in Christ that it has been my privilege to know. I reckon the grace of God was at work as much in their life as in mine to put up with a, a young, brash pastor who seemed to think he knew it all is an absolutely amazing and wonderful thing. I thank God for them. And I thank God for the privilege of being involved in a, in a church like this. Imagine, 16 years I've been here. 16 years. And I've seen children grow up. I've seen some come to know Jesus. I've seen some grow in, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and it's been Robin and my privilege to pray, to pray for God's people here in this place. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, uh, another verse where Paul is emphasizing the importance of encouragement. Encourage each other with these words. I wonder, Gavin challenged us when we came to church this morning, was it with a sense of gladness and joy that we had the opportunity to, to come together and worship God? I wonder whether that we can add to that and say, did we come with a view not only to be encouraged by others, but to be an encouragement to others? For we're called to that. That's God's plan and God's purpose for us. We are to encourage each other. Of course, in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, um, Paul had been speaking about 
what happens when people die and giving a biblical truth about that this God's got it all under control don't worry about it encourage one another with these words the second coming of Jesus God's got it all under control uh, when I was young I wanted to work it all out and I read Dwight Pentecost's big volume and I wrote marked it and all sorts of things do you know it's not important if we Oh, this is going to, some people you'll you think this is heresy but it's not so important that we know blow by blow what's going to happen but it is important that we know that Jesus is going to come back again and when he comes whether it be today next week next year next decade or next century when Jesus comes the important thing is not all the other stuff that's got to happen. The important thing is, are you ready to meet him when he comes? That's the important thing. And so uh, when I read that the Lord Jesus is going to come back again, I'm glad to share it, to encourage our hearts to be ready, not just for when Jesus comes, because he may call us to go there before we see him come here. Encourage each other with these words. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Build each other up. Don't knock each other down. Yes, you see, encouragement is uh, found in the scriptures. And when we gather together, it is with a heart to say, let us encourage one another. Paul talked about it. Uh, in fact, I read somewhere or other that the word encouragement is found 46 times in the New Testament because God wants us to look for ways to be an encouragement and a help, to build each other up, not pull each other down. I love that uh, verse in Hebrews 10.25. It's one of the ones I've marked in my Bible. It says... Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, thank you Lois, but encouraging one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Don't forsake assembling together. You know, Robin's been challenging me about this. She says, John, when you're not pastoring anymore, and you wake up Sunday morning, will you roll over to me and say, hmm, honey, I don't think we'll go this morning. <laughs> That's going to be a challenge, isn't it? I must talk to Bill about it and find out whether he has ever had that problem. <laughs> He's not going to nod his head one way or the other. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that, that can be an issue, can't it? Then it will really prove... When I, whether I'm really committed to meet together to worship God with other, other believers and to seek to be an encouragement to people around us. God wants us to look for ways to encourage one another. Well, this morning, uh, we're really just looking at these verses from verse 12 to verse 15. We ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with those who deserve it. You mean we've got to be patient with everybody? Oh, Paul must have got that wrong. He doesn't realise how much of a pain in the neck I can be. No, it says be patient with everyone. Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other, that's within the church, and for 
everyone else. Boy, that's pretty embracing, isn't it? Now, so this morning we're going to look at uh, this subject, godly leadership and graceful followership. Now that word, fo I was intrigued to find that. Well, I've never used that word before, followership. We use the word fellowship, don't we? But this morning it's followership because Jesus said to his disciples and he says to us today, uh, come unto me, no, come after me um, and I will make you to become fishers of men. When he said, come on, he said, follow me. Follow me. That's what Jesus said. Matthew 4, 19. So we've got, first we're going to look at godly leadership and uh, then we're going to have a look at graceful followership. So let's look at the first one. Paul lists three main characteristics of godly leadership. Now, you probably already know these, but this is what I have discovered. Leaders are hard workers. And, uh, and I want you this morning to be willing to acknowledge that this church has been blessed with godly leaders. And I know how hard working they have been. Because I've been there with them. I know that the eldership has met... Well, I didn't go back and count how many times, but it's been weekly for months and months and months. And uh, uh, the elders have, uh, have tremendous stamina. Why? Because as servant leaders, they believe there's a job to be done. And we have been privileged and graced to have that function and role. Now, um, why did I say leaders are hard workers? Well, I remember that the first apostles were hard workers. I remember that. You might remember with me in Luke chapter 5 how that um, um, the disciples decided they were going to go fishing. Um, and they were going fishing to catch fish. You know that I have very little interest in fishing for fish. I don't have that Midas touch to catch fish. But these men were fishermen. And they fished all night and like the song says... Fished all night and caught no fishes. Fished all night and caught no fishes. They didn't catch a fish all night. No fish. And uh, in the morning, the Lord Jesus called to them and said, Hey, Peter, put the net over the other side of the boat. And what happened? They caught more fish than they knew what to do with. Now, was Jesus able to see where the fish were or did he instruct the fish to be on that side of the boat? Absolutely no idea. But there was a great lesson here. And the great lesson was that God is the one who, who works in the life of the fish. We've just finished looking at Jonah. We believe that God can work in the life of a fish, don't we? We do now, anyway. And, and I, I have discovered over many, many years the truth of the scripture that says, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain trying to build it. We shouldn't try to do God's work in our strength. We need to do God's work in the strength and grace that God supplies. When Jesus said, catch any fish? Peter said, Master, oh Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. They worked hard. And those who know anything about professional fishermen know that they work hard. Uh, you see the boats going out. And of course, they've got uh, electric winches and all sorts of things today. The disciples didn't have that. They really had to throw the net in by hand. They had to pull the net back into the boat by hand. And uh, it was, it's hard work. It was hard work. Being a follower of Jesus is not easy. Except I'm standing up, I'd ask all those who find it easy to stand up. <laughs> 
I'd have to sit down. It's not easy. Living the Christian life the way God says costs us something. That's why we're called disciples of Jesus. It takes discipline to be a follower of Jesus. So leaders are hard workers. And, uh, and I thank God for all of the elders in the church. I thank God for the deacons and deaconess. I thank God for those who are leaders in different groups and ministries in the church here. Uh, uh, brothers and sisters, we've been blessed a lot more than we recognize. We have. We really have. Leaders oversee the flock. That's their, their calling. Peter talked about it in 1 Peter chapter 5. He said, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Now, I've been told that really the members don't matter. The leaders will make all the decisions. Wrong. That's not the case. It may be the case in some churches, but it's never been the case here. We talk here about servant leadership. And I can assure you that every leader in the spiritual oversight team Every leader in the ministry support team have got fantastic servant hearts. The people who were on the pastoral search team, fantastic servant hearts. And people just give of themselves. And I believe that that is a, a distinctive of godly leadership. It's a characteristic of godly leadership. Uh, we don't find someone who wants power we want someone who wants to serve. God can use every person in this building if we have servant hearts. That's true. Do you have a servant heart? If you do, God can use you. If you don't, uh, then you need to repent. We need to repent. Leaders are to oversee the flock, to watch over the flock, uh, to have a concern for the flock, eager to serve, not lording, lording it over, but being examples to the flock of what it means to love Jesus and serve him. So that's the second distinctive or characteristic of godly leadership. Number three, leaders admonish believers. In Acts chapter uh, 20, you might remember Paul was returning from one of his missionary journeys. Uh, he had been to a place called Miletus and um, uh, he came to a certain place, the ship went to the shore and he had sent messengers to get the elders to come from Miletus and, uh, and he met with them. I think Paul had a, a, an understanding that he wasn't going to be too long for this world, that his time was drawing to a close. Now I know it was a number of years before he died, but he, he didn't believe that he was going to go this way again. And so he, he, he talked to them, and this is what he said, be on your guard, remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. I love the bit, with tears. He saw his role as a pastor to the church to be not able, not only to encourage, but to warn, to warn, uh, to warn people to be serious about their walk with God. Leaders admonish believers. So we've had some three characteristics of godly leadership. Let's now turn to responsibility of graceful followership. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road for all of us, isn't it? And uh, we've got some here too. Number one, graceful fellowship love their leaders. Um, 
verse 12, 13 of 1 Thessalonians 5. We ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Oh, you see those points rising, don't we? Hold them in highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we're going to break that up a little bit more. True followers of Jesus love their leaders. They don't criticise their leaders. They love their leaders. Um, we can honour God by the way we love our leaders. And um, I've experienced that at a personal level. And, uh, and I'm encouraging us to do that for leaders in the future. Number two, regard their work Highly, verse 13. Hold them in highest regard in love. Why? Because of their work. Do you know there's a, there's a, a downside to being a leader? Um, I find it in the last chapter of Hebrews where it says, Obey them that have the rule over you. For they must give an account for their leadership. Leaders are answerable to God. Um, it, uh, it almost stopped me from going further because I recognised the tremendous uh, accountability that there is to those who are leaders. Hold them in highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So rather than criticise leaders... We should be encouraging them. Who said pray? Yep, pray for them. Yeah, and pray for them. So that's number two. Number three is promote peace. Did you see that in verse 13? Did you get that? Live in peace with each other. Up until this point of time in this passage, Paul has asked believers to love their leaders as, as, as asked believers to love their leaders, to welcome their work, but now he switches from asking to the imperative, or if you like, a command that they live in peace with each other. I remember the Lord Jesus in the, uh, we know it as the Beatitudes, don't we? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Why? For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh God, give us more peacemakers. Because peacemakers promote peace. And we are commanded to live in peace with each other. It's a command. Um, so if, if I've got a problem with gossiping, then I need to deal with it. Because that doesn't promote peace. If I have a spirit of negative criticism, I need to deal with it. God doesn't want me to have negative criticism. He wants me to be real. But often, I've discovered that we can be so, so right about what we're saying, but our attitude can be so, so wrong. It can be so destructive. That sort of criticism pulls people, Gavin... Down, 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 down. And we're to lift people up, 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 up. That's the reality. So as I think about uh, this subject, uh, effective leadership and effective followership translates into harmonious relationships. Uh, we, we've all... Uh, been around in churches that are filled with constant friction, tension and conflict. Is it fun? No, it's not fun. Definitely not. Is it destructive? Yes, it's destructive. Is it debilitating and wearing? Yes, very much so. And uh, we have the opportunity to make a difference in this regard. A psalm that I love is Psalm 133. And uh, I uh, quote this verse 1, particularly verse 1, 
how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. The old version says how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in harmony or unity. Yep. And, uh, and the psalmist actually uh, gives some illustrations. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Now, I'm always interested in the illustrations that David uses. He uses two of them. And the first one is oil flowing down over Aaron's beard. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus 8, um, there's a setting apart of Aaron as the high priest. And uh, that setting apart, that consecrating of his life as a high priest, uh, included anointing him with oil. And uh, they really anointed him with uh, plenty of oil. It ran down off his head and over his beard and, and onto his collar. And, um, and so I think what David was trying to say there was quite simply that a consecrated people uh, are a people who have unity of heart and life. Who's our high priest after the order of Melchizedek? Are there any other high priests? No. Are there any other priests? Christians are. It's called the priesthood of all believers. And we have been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and we are anointed as priests. And that anointing includes this whole aspect of dwelling together in unity. As one, we are called to serve the Lord God. And the other one was Mount Hermon, as if the dew of Mount Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is another word for Jerusalem. And uh, I, I read, a, when I was reading about this, uh, I read that snow really on Mount Hermon doesn't really get to Jerusalem. Well, could, the weather being like it is. But the snow that is on Mount Hermon, and even that amazed me. I've not been to Israel, but um, you know there are high spots in Israel. And when the snow melts, it runs into the Jordan River. Um, what was, what, why, why did David use this illustration? I believe he used this illustration to say that unity is a nourishing environment. It blesses, it encourages. Uh, out at Longreach, rain makes such a difference. What makes a difference to a church fellowship? Ah, it is that the mutual encouragement and unity amongst the brethren has a blessing attached to it. How good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity, as David said. Now, at my place at home, some years ago, um, we decided that we weren't going to give flowers that had been cut. We give flowers in pots so that they can be planted in the garden and, uh, and they last a lot longer than the ones that come uh, from the florist. And uh, we gave my mother some... Anyone tell me what these flowers are? They're gerberas. Yeah, they're gerberas. And um, we, we gave my mother some gerberas. They had flowers on them when we bought them, but she planted them, and for months and months there were no flowers. So Robin decided that she would bless her mother-in-law. She went down to a store, and she bought an artificial gerbera. And in the night time, she went out and stuck it in the middle of the plant. And my mother was thrilled. She's in heaven now, so she doesn't care about it anymore. But she was thrilled this gerbera was growing. And, uh, and she went out and she picked it. And she took it inside. And she got herself a 
pair of heavy duty scissors and she wanted to shorten the stalk so she could put it in a vase. And she said to Robin afterwards, she said, you know that gerbera? Boy, it had a stiff stalk on it. I could hardly cut it. Well, she needed a hacksaw or a pair of plies, not a pair of scissors. But she was, uh, if anything, my mum was perseverant. Now, I only told that as a light moment because I wanted to talk about these. Does anyone know what these are? I got one. I got one. Because we have a plant of this outside our front door and you'll notice some beautiful ones of these have been growing, but it's not a real one. Robin despaired of actually this one flowering. And, and I'm sure there's a heap of green fingers here. You will probably be able to tell uh, my darling wife what she needed to do to make it flower. Uh, but so having learned once, she would try again. And so she went and bought some of these and plumped them in there. And do you know the beauty of these? They don't fade. It can flower all year. But the unity amongst the brethren, is it the real deal or is it somewhat artificial? Brothers and sisters, we need to be real. We need to be the real deal. No artificiality. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It might be cosmetic, but the cosmetic one can't reproduce. Yeah, it's got a stamen in there, but it's gonna, you're never going to get a plant out of this. Our hearts and lives before God need to be 100% genuine. When we encourage one another, it's not a pretend encouragement. It needs to be real. It needs to be real. And so this morning, our prayer is this. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us, give us what? Peace. That's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Did you pick that up when we read it through? Nope, got to go back further than that to find it. I should have put that up, shouldn't I? Live in peace with each other. Peace will glorify God. It will encourage us in our lives. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement of it. That as, uh, as your people, we are to live in peace with each other. We are to encourage one another. We are to love our leaders. We are to regard their work and labour of love. Uh, Father, knowing that whatever we do for you, um, it has your hand on it if we have a humble, serving heart in the service that we render. Help us as followers of God to always seek your face. Father, there would be folk here in this fellowship this morning who are really struggling in their walk with you. And Father, we pray that your spirit would come alongside and humble the heart and cause those dear ones to be willing to cry out to you to draw near to God because you have said that if we draw near to you you will draw near to us and so we pray this that this fellowship may know a tremendous sense of peace with you but unity of heart and mind and life that as followers of God, our lives may become increasingly fruitful and honouring to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.